Well, welcome everybody and everybody who's joining us from, a, from around the world. And thank you so much for joining Population Matters live screening, uh, initially of the population segment of a really powerful new documentary, Endgame 2050, which focuses a pretty sobering lens on the future humanity is set for unless we make transformative changes to slow that accelerating existential environmental crises. The film features the musician Moby and along with leading scientists and activists and it's directed by doctor turned environmental filmmaker Sofia Pineda Ochoa who's with us on the panel. Now, Endgame 2050 is a really urgent wake up call to all of us and following the screening of the the 10 minute segment on population there'll be a live and I'm sure having talked to the panelists just now a pretty lively discussion uh, with our with our expert group, expert group of panelists, and I'll introduce everybody uh, in a moment. But just to say, for all our participants and our and those who are who are joining from around the world, I hope there will be time to put some of your questions directly to the panelists. But quite a lot of the ones I've seen already are covered by those that we are we are going to be um, directing at people. So, with no more ado, our panelists are Sophia Pineda Ochoa, who is the director of Endgame 2050. And I'm pretty sure, Sophia, you're still a practicing physician in Houston, Texas. You're nodding, so I that's am. a good sign. I have to pay my bills, so yes, Excellent. I still practice. Good. <laughs> uh, born and raised in Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, Sophia attended a medical school there, and her dream being to help people. And hence, she devoted a decade of her life, and still is, as a doctor, as a medic. But over time, her perspective and priorities have changed. And as she puts it, humanity, she believes, is not only making the planet uninhabitable for our civilization, but for the countless other species with whom we share it, hence making Endgame 2050. Professor Paul Ehrlich is a globally renowned ecologist and author of the seminal The Population Bomb, which was first published in 1968 in the US and then 1970 in the UK. President of the Center for Conservation Biology, Paul is also a patron of Population Matters. As well as alerting the world to the issue and impact of overpopulation, for which I have to say he's received a sort of equal, no, probably, you know, much praise, but a fair amount of abuse, probably more abuse than any environmentalist I know. So great credit to you for taking that on your shoulders, Paul. But he's also specialised in the long term study of those most ephemeral, ethereal creatures, butterflies. Another of his scientific concerns is cultural evolution, and he co-founded the Millennium Assessment of Human Behaviour. MAHB with his wife Anne and Professor Donald Kennedy. Professor Ehrlich has received numerous honorary degrees and awards for his work. Alicia Graves is a family planning and maternal health expert and she's president of California-based nonprofit Venture Strategies for Health and Development, which is soon to be renamed OASIS. Now, OASIS aims to advance education and choice for women and girls in the Sahel, the Sahel region and she notes that upholding girls and women's rights is intrinsically good and a prerequisite for stabilizing global population and ensuring a sustainable population. As she sums it up rather better than me, population is sexy and serious. Alicia sits on PM's expert advisory group. And finally, Leilani Munta is a retired racing car driver, but still one of the fastest, most successful of that rare breed of women competing in that macho world. A passionate environmental activist, Leilani has a degree in biology from the University of California, volunteering at a wildlife rescue and rehabilitation center during her college years. An advocate for renewable energy, solar power, electric cars, plant-based diets and animal rights, she's on the board of three nonprofits, Oceanic Preservation Society, Empowered by Light and EarthX Films, and is also a patron of Population Matters. An almost lifelong vegetarian, she went 100% vegan in 2011. In her own words, never underestimate a vegan hippie chick with a race car. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And I hope we can go to the film now for the screening and then we'll return to the panel discussion. Yeah, thank you, Robin. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Bear with me a few seconds. Okay. Can you all see that? Yeah. Great. Our rapidly growing population
globalization is a multiplier that affects every global environmental issue we face. And the fact is, we've had an unprecedented spike in our population over the last two centuries. That coupled with our consumption patterns is placing serious strain on our planet's finite natural resources and ecosystems. The number of people on the planet would not matter if we were ethereal beings. What matters is the combination of the number of people and their economic activity, namely consumption and waste products. Our species, modern humans, has been around for about 200,000 years. And it took us all that time to reach a population of 1 billion, which we finally did relatively recently in the early 1800s. But today, only about 200 years after that, we've multiplied seven times over. We are now more than 7.5 billion humans and on track to hit close to 10 billion by the year 2050. I'm concerned about population because if you look at over all of human history, it took up until the 1800s to reach the first 1 billion people on Earth. And then the, the last 1 billion people to go from 6 to 7 billion people on Earth took only about 12 years. Why did our population grow so quickly in just the last two centuries? Well, simply put, we've had the very good fortune of being able to decrease child mortality and increase our life expectancies as a result of the agricultural revolution and technological advances in modern medicine. So more children now grow up, live longer, and have children of their own. And this in the aggregate dramatically increased the world population in a short period of time. Every year we're adding eight, about 80 million extra people to the planet and that is about the population of Germany. So if you think about the need to find a, a good home for those people, to ensure that they have access to food, that they have access to clean water, that they have health care and education, it really puts things into perspective. When I was born in 1932, there were 2 billion people on the planet. Now there are 7.5 billion people. The size of the human population has more than tripled in my one lifetime. One of the really critical things, the resource that we'll never run out of, is morons. Morons, for instance, say it's only consumption. It's not the number of people that counts. That's like saying the area of a rectangle is determined only by its width, not by its length. Certainly, consumption is a big problem. So is population size. The two multiply together to give you your impact on your life support systems. Never in human history have we asked so much of our environment, our infrastructure, and our society to accommodate such large increases in our population over such a short period of time. Just as one example, at the pace we're currently growing our population, we need to be building 63,000 new classrooms every single week, repeatedly, week after week, if we want every child to have access to education. Funding, building, and staffing 63,000 new classrooms every single week, over and over. So are we building them? And are we prepared to keep building at that pace every single week? The answer is no. Unfortunately, we are not building them. And I don't think it's realistic to think that we could at that pace. The impact of human beings on the planet doubles every 17 years. That is, if you take the rate of population growth and add to it the rate of economic growth and put those two things together, we make twice the impact on the planet every 17 years. And you can't do that for many doublings before you destroy the planet. A lot of people think the population problem is too many Indians or too many people in Africa and so on. Actually, it's too many people in the United States to start out with. You and I consume much more than the average person in Africa or the average person in India, and that's part of the problem. To support the people we have today, the current estimate is you need one and a half Earths to do it. To support the people we have today at the style of the average American, you'd need four or five more Earths. We're living on our capital, not on our interest. 
It's as if we were an idiot child that inherited a million dollars and kept writing bigger checks on the bank account every year and never looking at the balance. We're using up our precious soils. We're using up our easily accessible resources. Basically, we're behaving like idiots because we're the only species we know of that is determinedly set out to destroy itself. Supposing the moon had water and an atmosphere and we had a cheap way of getting there. At the present rate of population growth, we'd fill it up in 10 years. It wouldn't help us. Given the fundamental importance that our population plays in so many converging environmental issues, you think the environmental organizations would be having a robust conversation about it, yet most don't talk about population growth that much, if at all. If you think about any controversial topic, people are always aware of difficult subjects and if they bring those difficult subjects up, it may get them into trouble. So if you go to a dinner party and you bring up population and people jump all over you, they'll say, okay, I won't touch that again. There are a few reasons why people are afraid to talk about population, but I think at the heart of it, um, because there have been some uh, coercive population programs and policies, uh, people are afraid that if they make these links between population and the environment, that it's suggesting that we have to control the population, that there has to be some external force. But good population policies and programs respect what couples want, and they're about giving women and, and men what they want and not telling people what to do. In talking about the very real problem of unsustainable population growth, I believe the focus needs to be on raising awareness of the issue, promoting gender equality and women's rights around the world, supporting things like family planning so that all women have the means to determine the number and spacing of their children, encouraging small family norms, supporting adoption efforts, increasing education, eradicating poverty, and abolishing horrid practices like child marriages. These human rights efforts are critically important in their own right, but they also happen to be some of the most effective actions we can take to help slow our population growth rate. Also, in our culture, there are still sometimes some religious or social pressures that can make people feel like they have to have children or they have to have a certain number of children, even if they don't really want to. Even if you're capable of having and supporting children, no one should feel like they must have children if that's not what they want to do. As a personal example, I actually underwent tubal ligation or permanent sterilization surgery several years ago while single and childless. Even though I love kids, I just don't have the inclination to have any children of my own. And that's okay. But no woman or man should feel like they have to have children simply in response to social pressures. And for the benefit of all humans, including today's children and future generations to come, I think we have a moral obligation to raise awareness about the unsustainability of our current population growth rate and the importance of slowing that rate down as well as changing our consumption patterns so that we avoid irreparably depleting and destroying the very environmental systems on which we humans and all other species depend. So I, I think that the silence around population has to, be, has to be broken and people have to speak out about the relationship between population and environment. That there is something we can do to slow population growth and it will have drastic benefits for access to resources, access to land, access to water, food security clean air, stable climate, all of that's affected by population. It will be much easier to manage these challenges if we can slow and stabilize population growth than if we continue a business as usual path. A lot of us, myself included, everyone watching, like most of us self-identify as good people. Of the 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet, I guarantee you almost all of them think that they're a good person and they're leading a good life. They're like looking after their family. I'm like, but we are not judged on how we self-identify. 
we're judged on our actions, you know, and if our actions cause misery and destruction and suffering, we're not good people, you know, and who, I'm not God, it's not my place to judge, but like, where do we get the idea that we're living good, benign lives if the product of our lives is nothing but suffering and destruction? Okay, back to you, Robin. Thank you. So I really urge people to watch the whole film. Um, if you don't mind me saying, Sophia, at times it's quite hard watching, um, but we need to do some hard watching. I think that's the whole point of it. Uh, you've just been virtually speaking on the film. I'm rather unfairly going to come straight to you, Sophia, and ask you to speak live now. And as we said in the, in the biog, you, you trained and practiced and still practice a, as a medical doctor. What, what prompted you to become a filmmaker? There we go, unmuted. Um, I think once we get hit with, um, with the scale and the magnitude and, and you know, how severe these existential problems are, I think it's kind of a, like a normal reaction to try to do you know what we can to help this like dire situation that we find ourselves in and you know the the film is like a very humble attempt in my part in trying to do something like that um <clears throat> i think we're living in a very special time right now in human history uh in history in the history of the planet in general because you know, these great things have happened over time. Like we've developed this great technology to be so efficient with extracting resources and using them and we develop agriculture. But right now, all of those things have kind of come back to bite us because of how we're behaving. And ultimately what's going on right now is um, we're unfortunately you know, destroying every last shred of nature on the planet. And I think that we don't realize that we really depend also on the nature and having a livable, you know, ecosystem. And so that's, to me, something that really, really, you know, bothers me. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, I try to kind of, I feel like if people understood that, like if people knew how much we depend on the environment, they would be more proactive in trying to change our behavior. Yes. Um, but they see it kind of as a virtuous thing or it's just something cool to do, but that's not the case. You know, we really depend on it. So that's oh, kind of okay. like the message so that, well, that, that's, that's a very good introduction. And I'm just wondering if there's something particular because you are a environmental campaigner and, and everyone else on the panel most certainly is. And I guess a lot of people out there watching are too. But is there something about a film or, or a documentary drama that as you produce that can sort of cut through in a way that, you know, we have been putting, you know, Paul has been putting the science forward. You know, I've been doing my pathetic little part in policy advocacy and campaigning for decades. What is it about a film that 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 may cut through in a way that, that sort of work doesn't? Well, <clears throat> the way that I understand, like our, the way that we behave and the way that even like our brain behaves, our emotional center has a very strong um, say in how we behave, and so I think. I guess, I think, you know, everything helps and everything is important. And sometimes some people react differently to different, excuse me, to different things. But I think sometimes with the film, it helps do this kind of visceral, emotional um, part of it. And it just creates, you know, that component and that can be favorable to, 
you know, to just realizing, oh, okay, we do need to do what we can to raise awareness and to change our ways because, you know, this is, this is really a problem. So I guess the visceral yeah. component is what I okay. would hope. <laughs> and there's certainly a good deal of visceral component and I, cause I have watched the film and it's very, very powerful. And just, just to follow up on that, how, how's the film being received? What's, what is the response so far, would you say? You know, I have been surprised. I made the film, obviously I wanted to, you know, reach as many people as possible. And, but it's like, because I'm not a filmmaker, I'm just like a nobody physician, you know? I, I had very little expectations, you know? And I've been surprised. Like, let me give you an example. The government of Mexico's public channel, they asked me for a license and they aired it on their prime time on the public channel of Mexico. And here I was thinking like, oh, they're gonna hate this, they're gonna hate that, everyone is gonna be so hungry. And, and of course there's been pushback and there's, also, there's been a lot of um, conspiracy science denialism pushback from climate change to even the globe. Some people say that we don't live in a round globe. So there's been a <laughs> lot that, of that. that that's great, that, thank you. That, and that's a very good sort of segue to come uh, to you, Professor Ehrlich, Paul, because um, it's no surprise as you feature prominently in the film, because you, you know, as I said, you bear the scars and laurels of over 50 years of trying to highlight population concern. And in a way, the fact that Sophia's made this film partly answers my question, but do you see any greater awareness or acknowledgement of population as a key driver of our ecological existential crisis than over the past, you know, 40 years? I think it's coming along. One of the things is excellent films and other art and literature things, which help a lot. Uh, I have to second what Sophia said, because, you know, if the part of your brain that deals with your emotions is ablated in an accident, uh, you can still decide, know what the menus and prices are in every restaurant in your town, but you can't decide where to go to dinner. Emotions are an incredibly important part uh, of our lives. And uh, just telling people more science has nowhere near the impact that stories have, that art has, that films have, and so on. Uh, I keep telling my colleagues who happily agree with me, even though they don't like it very much, that it isn't science we need more of. It's much more in the humanities. It's much more the sort of thing that Bill Ryerson does, who was did a very nice thing in the film uh, where he shows soap operas. He does a survey of attitudes towards women on a soap opera before a soap opera. Then he shows a soap opera in which women uh, issues are discussed. And then afterwards, another survey shows it's actually changed attitudes. And there, as was indicated well in the film, we desperately need attitudes. There is not a single place on the planet where women have equal rights, equal opportunities, and so on with men. And again, we have lots of data that show if you give women opportunities and you give women equal rights, uh, they tend to prefer a motorbike uh, to a third child. And uh, that's a very important way, I think the most basic way of dealing with the population issue is to educate women and give everybody access to modern contraception and back up abortion. Great, and you're, you're setting us up nicely for some of the other panelists to comment on that who specialize in that area. I, I've actually got a first edition of the UK, uh, the population bomb, and I must have had it for quite a long time, but it took me only recently to realize that it was first published in this country in partnership with Friends of the Earth, where I worked for a long time. And yeah, despite the efforts of a small number of us, and I'm pretty sure that my boss at the time, Jonathan Porritt is, is out there uh, looking in on this. He particularly and, and others were pushing, Friends of the Earth should talk about population, but they didn't, they wouldn't, and they still don't mention the P word. I, I just wonder what your thoughts are why otherwise courageous conservation organizations are sort of willfully blind to the issue of population. Well, there's something like uh, my university and most universities, our society made a big mistake a few hundred years ago and became almost totally financialized. And everything is judged by how much money it makes, how much money you have. Uh, 
how much the donors will give, how much the politicians need to buy uh, uh, the vote, to buy the votes of politicians, and so on. And they're scared witless uh, that they'll get less money if they mention population. Uh, and they're in some sense correct. In other words, uh, you're working against yourself. So the argument you can make is, well, we're not going to discuss population, even though we know it's incredibly important. Uh, but uh, we're going to do good in other areas. And the problem is, as you all know, uh, if you keep the population growing, even if we reduce consumption continuously, uh, we're on a finite planet. You Growth is the disease. It's not the cure, as most politicians think. Uh, and I also have to admit, there's a lot of racism in this world. There's racism in the United States, as we've seen dramatically. We thought we'd done a lot to knock it down up through Ronald Reagan. And then since then, the Republican Party has become totally racist uh, and is still at it. And of course, uh, there have been, uh, there's a big racial component in the population issue. It's people of not my color, people who are poor, people who are Indian, people who are Mexican, those terrible Mexican, I mean, here we have right on our own show, a, a, a robber and a rapist. And aren't all Mexicans robbers and rapists? I thought so. I, uh, <laughs> so uh, these are all real factors that we have to consider. Uh, and uh, a very important thing to get the world to work is to get rid of racism, just like to get rid of sexism. Otherwise, you're not having all the minds that could be working in the right direction, uh, not. They're working uh, to save themselves, basically. Thank you very much. I mean, great straight talking and, and, and inconvenient truths. I mean, one of the things we found at Population Matters is that we actually have very little difficulty talking about population with our friends and colleagues and partners in Africa and Asia and Latin America. It's a very different conversation with colleagues uh, in the UK uh, and um, across Europe. They seem to be re reluctant. And Alicia's just pointed out to me to remind, remind our, our, our watchers that the quote that Paul gave was from the great, late, or maybe not quite so great, um, depending on your views, President Trump, who I think you described as an your imbecile president, Paul. But that's another yes. that's another subject altogether. Just by sort of, I know you you have just published a pretty powerful paper with about fifteen other leading scientists, in which you're warning the world's leaders and the public that they are just not aware of the gravity of the environmental existential crisis we're facing and you use this, I think that's one of the things you've done in a couple of papers I've read of yours, the, the early one in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Scientists are starting to use pretty strong phrasing and language within peer reviewed papers. And you talk about a ghastly future unless, unless the world wakes up. Is anyone beyond this panel and our audience waking up to the gravity of the situation? I think people are increasingly understanding that we're in deep, deep trouble. You know, uh, I spent, uh, Anne and I spent last November in Australia, our second home, and uh, basically choked continuously in the fires that were smoking out Sydney. Then we came back to California. The same thing is happening here. People are beginning to understand, and the data seem to show that people understand we're moving in the wrong direction at a great rate. Uh, and the numbers are not cheering. Uh, for example, uh, we all have tended to talk about stabilizing population. Actually, I don't know a single scientist who's looked into these issues who thinks that stabilizing population uh, should be the goal. The goal ought to be a gradual and humane shrinkage of population because all the data indicate that the long-term sustainability of societies of the sort we have now at least uh, you're going to be at, in trouble anywhere above 2 billion in probably. So we're about four times as big as we ought to be now. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the, there is this opposition that uh, basically says uh, we should prevent, uh, we should never prevent births. Uh, it's critical that all uh, fetuses, um, uh, you know, every baby you can possibly have, and then they lose all interest in what happens to the children. Uh, and one of the nice things in the film 
is showing that, you know, if you want to raise kids, it's kind of nice to have schoolhouses for them. Uh, but uh, those things aren't considered. The care for the child somehow ends at birth. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, a typical Republican view in the United States. Right now, we have large numbers of people who are hungry. Uh, we have large numbers of people who don't have work. And yet the Republican administration keeps wanting to give more and more money to the very richest people in society who don't need it. Well, I must admit, I was, I was really pleased to see that um, one of the first things that uh, President Biden uh, rescinded was um, the global gag, which is the, 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 the law whereby no USA can go to any family planning organization, development organization, which isn't, you know, 300% opposed to abortion under any circumstances. I imagine Alicia may talk about that a bit later, but that was something positive. Leilani, if I can just come to you now, I mean, talking about numbers, I mean, the, the film, Sophia's film is amplified really eloquently by Moby, and I think you did brilliantly to, to, to get him on board, Sophia. He's, he's such an articulate spokesperson. And it focuses on the huge impact of industrial livestock production. I mean, I'm not going to grace it with the, the name of farming, but I, and it all, you know, so it's focused on livestock production alongside human population and the relationship between them. And I've seen figures from organizations like Compassion in World Farming, which is based here in the UK, where they say that for every million extra human beings that are born and come onto our planet, along with them come 10 million intensively reared pigs, poultry, cattle, etc. As an environmental activist and vegan, can you see then, and do you think there's a valid link to make between our food and family planning choices and their impacts on the planet? Absolutely. So I, um, you know, I, I went vegan in 2011. I chose to not have children um, after I had a biochemistry professor at UC San Diego show a short film about uh, population one day. I had never thought about population before then. Um, and just everything that I do, you know, my house is solar powered. I have been driving an electric car since 2013. Every single decision I make, I feel like I'm trying to do my best to reduce my impact on the environment. And I think a lot of people focus um, on cars and uh, what kind of fuel they're putting in their vehicles. And they're not oftentimes thinking about what's on their dinner plate. Um, and that has a huge impact. And I think actually now with the pandemic, you know, this is coming up more and more uh, as we are ripping down uh, the rainforest to put in pastures to grow livestock so that we can slaughter them and eat them. Um, we are actually causing more spillover events to happen uh, with viruses. So uh, two thirds of all the viruses that affect humanity, um, you know, are zoonotic viruses that spill over from other animals. And every time that we're ripping down a forest, um, you know, not only are we making it so that the wild species are living in a closer proximity, whether it be directly to people or whether it be closer to the livestock, and you risk that jump happening either directly into humans or into livestock, and then we consume the livestock and we start getting sick. So I think, you know, right now, the fact that we're all doing this panel from our homes, because, you know, it's almost impossible to gather safely now, um, is another thing that we need to highlight that this lesson of, as we destroy the world around us, we are uh, bringing about more opportunities for diseases to jump at us. Um, so, you know, being vegan is a, is a part of one of the the efforts that I make to reduce my carbon footprint, but by far and above the number one thing that I've done is, you know, choosing my husband and I choosing to be child free by choice. And, and if you look at the carbon impact that you have on all of these decisions, electric car, solar power, veganism, all of them are dwarfed uh, by the, the decision to not have a child. Yeah, and, and that is so powerful. And uh, that interests me Again, because I, you know, I, I, the film is a, is a very powerful, um, uh, it, it very powerfully makes the case for veganism, um, particularly at the end. 
but I th and I think there are many vegans who go absolutely right but whether they will actually make the connection and say smaller families as well that seems to be a step too far for an awful lot of otherwise really you know well informed strong campaigners on a whole range of issues whether it's climate change or animal rights somehow that jumped population. So do, do you think people are getting that, are making that? You certainly obviously have, Sophia obviously has, but out there? You know, I have, I mean, I've gotten into arguments with people online that are literally telling other vegans that they need to breed because we need more vegans in the world. <laughs> and I, I, I can't stand this because obviously the solution is not, <laughs> not to bring more kids into the world, which first of all, if you have a kid and you raise it vegan, there's no guarantee that that child will stay vegan, first of all. Um, second of all, we already have over seven and a half billion people on the planet. So why not just work towards having the people that are already here um, give up meat and dairy products. I think that's a much better way to spend your time. <laughs> so yes, there is a definite disconnect there. And I think there's a disconnect there uh, across the board, whether you're somebody that works in clean energy or, you know, there's a lot of environmentalists that just refuse to talk about population. And I understand why they do that. You know, I did an interview, I think it was a French magazine that I did an interview with. And I was basically talking about how I came to this decision to not have children. And that, you know, it was all based on this interaction with my biochemistry professor. And I got so when it came out, I mean, I got thousands of messages of people to tell, telling me to commit suicide. You know, what is the point of me being even on the planet if I'm not going to have children? And, you know, if I'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint, why not just take myself out? And then I'm, you know, really reducing my carbon footprint. It was just the, the anger that came from that interview um, was unbelievable. And, you know, I watched the interview and I, I'm really not saying anything other than this is why I made this decision. But people get really angry about it. So I think, you know, one of the big things we can do is what we're doing right now, which is talk about it and just make more people feel comfortable that this is a subject, one, that's important, but two, that we need to be able to talk about. Because as long as we keep sweeping it under the rug, um, you know, this is, a, this is a really big problem if we don't address this. It, it dwarfs all other environmental causes because it's really, you know, it's the granddaddy of them all. Like Paul said, we can all drive electric cars and we can all put solar on our roof and we can all go vegan. That still doesn't matter if we're increasing our numbers by a million people every five days. Um, so I, I do feel like people are waking up, but it is a such a volatile subject. Yeah, absolutely. And you've, you, there's, you, you've triggered for, for, for a question a bit later on that's, that's, that's come in. Um, Paul, you very nicely set up Alicia in terms of talking about the empowerment of women and choice as being absolutely key to addressing the issue of population, overpopulation, but also the environmental crisis. And Alicia, your organization focuses on empowering women and girls, particularly in the Sahel region of Africa. I mean, can you expand on that for us and, and just sort of tell us why that focus and why that region in particular? Thanks, Robin. Um, I'll just start by um, just reminding people where is the Sahel. It's actually a, an ecological transition zone that goes across the widest part of the African continent. So from Senegal and Mauritania in the west uh, over to Ethiopia in the east. We're focused on the Francophone Sahel countries. So that's um, Mauritania, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Mali, Chad, and Niger. And we include northern Nigeria um, because it's such a massive um, uh, there's such a massive population there and they have a lot of cultural similarities with the, um, you know, the Hausa ethnic group, which goes between Niger and Northern Nigeria. Um, why are we focused on, on the Sahel? Um, frankly, because it's some of the poorest countries in the world where women are among the least empowered. And I remember seeing a, a sort of three-way Venn diagram of, um, you know, about, about women's empowerment in Niger. And it showed that only 1% of women in Niger don't fall in the category of condoning wife beating, um, being married as a child and uh, lacking control over household resources. So that was really stunning to me. 
and it um, I got interested in it um, around the time that um, my my mentor and uh, the co-founder of this initiative, Malcolm Potts, um, was looking at the the population projections for countries in this in this part of the world. Um, they're growing faster. Niger is the highest fertility rate in the world, and it's growing faster than any other country in, in human history that's documented. Um, and we found, we started to look into the, the climate situation there and um, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab at, um, the Lawrence National Lab at Berkeley, uh, there's a science, climate scientist there, Michael Weiner, who um, we were talking to, this is back in 2012, and discovered that um, the, the air surface temperature in this part of the world is increasing faster than other anywhere else in the world, or at least um, at, you know it's among the fastest uh, you know change in temperature. So by 2050, um, the temperature in Niger, already very hot, is going to increase by two to three degrees Celsius. So it's really um, this terrible um, kind of overlapping of, of factors um, that have caused us to to focus on this part of the world, and then. I like to tell the story about like why personally I'm interested because I've always been very passionate about family planning. I don't think we can talk about women's empowerment until we make sure that every woman can control her fertility. So um, I, unlike the other women on the panel, I have two children by choice. I would have liked to have more, um, but uh, I did, you know, consciously, um, you know, limit my fertility. When my youngest was, um, my second and youngest is a little girl, Evelyn. I was breastfeeding her, this is in 2012, so she was about half a year old, and I was um, increasingly looking at the data about the Sahel, the current context, what's coming down the road in terms of population, in terms of climate and hunger. And I'm breastfeeding her, and I'm just, I was just starting to introduce solid food. So I'm thinking like, okay, tomorrow I can go into the kitchen and I can whip up mashed potatoes, or I can make a kind of applesauce for her, or mash up avocados. She had like this voracious appetite. And, uh, you know, it was a beautiful moment. And then I just got struck thinking about this quote I had read from a mother in Senegal, who says she goes to bed every night worrying about how she's going to feed her children. And she wakes up in the morning worrying about the same. And it was at that moment that I realized this is one of the, the greatest injustices in the world, parents who can't feed their children. Um, and when we in the, in the US um, just have such an excess of everything, including food, so that's kind of what pulled me in and, and made me really want to become what I call a factivist, you know, using using science and evidence to really try to change things. In the and region. just to just to intercede, I think that that great that's a great example of you know, all of us who work on population are really aware of the equity issues and the global justice issues and and the disconnect and the disproport you know, Paul put up that. You know, if you're an American standard of living, you've just you've just exemplified it in you know, not probably up at five Earths, Alicia, but you know the average American system would need five Earths if everybody. Oh, sorry, if everybody lived like the average American, we'd need five Earths. Well, that ain't going to happen. Not even with Elon Musk, you know, going to whatever planets he wants to create an atmosphere on next. You know, let's have a mission to Earth and sort that out. But, but I think one of the things I just wanted to add to that is, in, and similarly as Paul mentioned, consumption. This, there's this myth about population activists that we only focus on people over there and other people. We focus on ourselves. We focus on the countries we work and live in, just as you said very eloquently about America. And, you know, we in Population Matters have a project, for example, working with doctors, I'm glad to say, Sophia, in the English Midlands, which is shamefully still one of the most deprived areas in the UK. You know, we claim we are a very developed country, but we have areas, deep pockets of poverty, and it's areas, ironically, of former coal mining communities, which, yes, they had to stop digging coal and burning coal, but nothing was put there in their place. It's still got one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in the UK, and the UK still has one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in Europe, to our shame. And their doctors with PM, with Population Matters, are doing education projects with teenage girls there to try and break the cycle. There's another project in North Wales. I'm aware of parts of the states, as Paul talked about. You know, child marriage is still legal in states in the US. Actually, it's still relatively legal in the UK, but people don't know that. So it's not about either or, it's about both. But it's also about focusing attention where we can make a difference. And I think that you know your focus on empowering young women and girls 
for things they want, for basic human rights that are their right, and that are the technology is there, Alicia, isn't it? It's all there potentially. Sorry, I'm talking and I shouldn't be. Over back to you. Well, I want to. I wanted to say actually that there's a huge opportunity in the Sahel. If you look at the the demographic and health surveys, you can see that there are about twice as many women who say they want to um, space by two years or limit their their childbearing, but they're not using contraception. Contraception. So we call that having an unmet need for family planning. And despite the the patriarchal and very conservative societies that are in this part of West Africa. Um, there is there is a there's a great opportunity there to reach those women with the information and means to separate sex from pregnancy and childbearing, and uh, I, I always like to say that you know we've been working with a group in northern Nigeria called Center for Girls Education, um, and through the Safe Space model, which is mentored clubs for early adolescent girls, um, in the in the communities where we're offering safe spaces, we've seen a twenty fold increase in completion of secondary school and a two and a half years increase in the age of marriage from about 14 and a half to 16.9. So that's a huge time in a, in a young girl's life um, for her to develop both physically and emotionally and, and intellectually. So um, I, I also wanna say we are, um, I'm at, I can be reached at oasis at berkeley.edu and I'm seeking introductions to senior people in European government. So I know Robin, we can talk more about that, but if anybody listening has, um, has connections. Um, we are looking to do a kind of Oasis conference to get more attention and investment to this part of Africa, to the Sahel, um, for girls education and family planning. Brilliant. And I just want to bring you on to that other part of the your your equation and and, and interest on on climate change. I know you um, have contributed as a research associate for Project Drawdown, which is this brilliant initiative uh, set up by Paul Hawkin. Who, you know, the simple premise was let's find the best available solutions to climate change that we can we can implement now. And in that, in those top solutions, as you've said, enabling girls to get into education, to have choice over contraception, those were some of the top 10 solutions to climate change. I mean, they're clearly good things in their own right, but I had sort of two sub, sub questions to you. You know, how, how do they cut carbon emissions and why don't we hear Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and WWF and all those other climate activists championing Project Drawdown and those those two solutions which combined would save and cut more carbon dioxide than all onshore and offshore wind power combined. It's a you can see it's a bit of a, a bugbear of mine. Yeah, mine too. Um one of my mentors, Martha Campbell, used to call it the population factor and getting people to acknowledge that the population is a factor in all of these other issues for sustainability. Um, so family planning and girls education together, um, we, I was in the early stages of it. The model was, has changed over the last few years, but um, um, they have calculated that um, by, sh by changing the population trajectory, by middle of this century, there can be a reduction by about 85 gigatons of greenhouse gases. So it comes out at the very top. There, it's problematic because unfortunately, what has happened historically is that as people have smaller families, their economic situation improves and they consume more. And that consumption part wasn't able to be worked into it. But I think that we can kind of decouple this um, consumption from um, from education and from uh, from choice. In other words, I think people can, um, you know, we can make sure that girls are have choices around marriage and women have choices around childbearing. That can lead to greater well, you know, income and, and well being around the household without necessarily um, um, cutting um, increasing our carbon footprints. It's difficult. I want to say, you know, Paul Hawken did that with a woman named Amanda Ravenhill, and her mother used to work at PSI with Malcolm Potts. Um, and I think it's only thanks to that connection that they thought about family planning and included it in the model. Um, because what most environmentalists and climate scientists and everybody else who does analysis about future projections, they tend to take the UN medium variant and plug it in as if it were gospel. And we know that demographic demography can be changed in ways that respect and uphold women's rights. So, so well, that's what we did. We looked at two different scenarios, you know, what's a business as usual versus what's optimistically plausible with population. And then 
if you haven't, if the participants here haven't looked at drawdown, I encourage you to. They have all different um, solution sectors, and then those sectors like transportation, land use, food, et cetera, were plugged into the different um, population uh, scenarios. Um, how is it connected? I mean, education in parts of the world where there's early marriage is protective because it's the best alternative for early marriage and childbearing, keeping girls in school. Um, the other kinds of connections between education, family planning, and, and, and emissions is, you know, as, as girls are more educated, um, they have, tend to have more decision power, decision-making power in the, in the household. Um, they're more likely and more able to work outside of the home, which would mean that they probably want to have a smaller family, and they have better access to health care. So I always say like education is, is good on its own, but it's insufficient because it needs to be coupled with access to family planning and access to safe abortion. Um, I'm stealing this from Malcolm, but you know, I have a graduate degree, but it doesn't affect my ovulation and my, my fertility. What does affect it is the fact that I have an IUD. So that has to be part of the equation. Um, we have to be able, we have to have, make sure that every woman has the information and means to separate having sex from pregnancy and childbearing if she wants. Brilliant. I'm, I'm gonna come back to everybody in a minute, but I just wanted to follow up um, something Leilani um, really powerfully brought home in that French interview, how you got trolled hideously afterwards. And I think if I'm correct, and, 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 and do correct me if I'm not, and, and others jump in, but I'm, I, I know Leilani and Sophia, both of you have chosen to be child free. And, and Sophia, you, talked very um, honestly about your your choice and, and the procedure you've had and you you know so you've you've both been open about it and spoken openly about it but just as you said Leonardo we get a lot I mean we have a small families campaign here at Population Matters and we've heard from the both the men and women particularly the women in that how they faced a lack of acceptance how they've had criticism and as as uh Alicia certainly pointed out in some countries and cultures, much worse from making the decision to have smaller families, not to have another child or not to have any children. And just be great to hear from you both about, you know, your experiences if you've had similar and, what, and what's your advice for dealing with it to anybody who's uh, listening in, watching in. I always try and point out that, you know, by me making the decision to not have any children, that's actually going to make the world a better place for all the people that are on the planet, including people that have had children. So if you're a parent and you're offended that I made the choice to not have children because I'm trying to you know, realize that we're on a finite planet, we're gonna run out of resources, you should actually be happy that I chose to not have children because that's gonna make it easier for your children to have access to more resources because there's gonna be less people fighting over resources. So I try and point out how it's good for their kids even if they've made that choice. And one of the things that I have done, while well, this is pre-pandemic when I used to travel, <laughs> but when I did travel, you know, oftentimes the, the first or second question somebody asks when they sit next to you on an airplane um, or a bus or whatever is, do you have kids? And I used to say, no, we don't have children. Now I say, no, actually we, we are child-free by choice. And just by adding those two words at the end of this, the sentence, by choice, it has sparked so many conversations with people to then talk about, oh, by choice, why did you make that decision? You know, and I can explain where it came from and that it wasn't that I wanted to have kids and couldn't have them. And, you know, I've had this discussion with parents where they say, you know, I had four kids and I just really wasn't thinking about population at that time, but now I do really think about it, you know, and I'm going to sit down with my four girls and I'm going to, I'm going to have a chat with them about population. I don't want them to feel obligated to have children. So I think it's wonderful if you can just sort of put it out there for people. And then if they're curious and they are interested, which I have found that they almost always are, um, to have that kind of a, a friendly discussion about it. Um, and as far as the trolls went, you know, I just finally hit mute on that discussion. So I, I couldn't see all of their horrible um, 
their horrible comments and I, I didn't even, I quit Facebook. So I, I didn't even see all the horrible things that people said on there. But I think sometimes with that sort of hatred, it's sometimes easier to just try and ignore it, try and mute it and, and, and walk away from it. Cause you're not going to reach most of those people. Yeah. I, I've, I've got Paul coming in, I think on the troll factor, but, uh, and, and then um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Sophia to give her views. I say, Paul, I, I, I've discovered actually in this panel an example of prejudice against women that I didn't know. And that is I had plenty, plenty of death threats and similar stuff, just like Leilani. But I also greatly advertised my vasectomy and I never got any criticism on that. It's weird. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the people who are idiots don't understand that it takes two to tango. Uh, <laughs> That's all I had to say. That there. Is, no, that's a great interjection. And we're going to we're going to come on to that a bit more. Sophia, how, do you want to add something in, in, in terms of your experience? Sure. Well, I had um, I hadn't actually op talked about it openly until, you know, I mentioned it in the film. And I think it's surrounded by so much information about the impact of our population. A lot of people who have watched the film have said, oh, you know, I'm changing my diet and I'm not having kids. And so I think it kind of impresses upon people, you know, the impact that our population is having. And I think that part of the problem why we, you know, there's pushback and there's, you know, abuse and all of that is because at a fundamental level, people don't understand the fact that we are vastly overpopulated, you know, with regards to the environment, when we talk about overshoot, we really are, you know, vastly overpopulated when it comes to kind of every single metric from, from our CO2 to our soil erosion to how we're using water. And I think that if people understood that, that would be immensely helpful um, because they would make different choices. You know, human rights is so important. Women's rights is so important, but also here in the States, you know, I have friends who have no problem with education, who have no problems with having access to family planning, and yet they decide to have five children. And um, so I just think that it would be so nice if, if it was just more widely understood, the fact that we are in an overshoot, in a severe environmental overshoot, the fact that we are vastly overpopulated. And it would be a lot more accepted you know, and, and then hopefully people would also, you know, make different decisions about having smaller families if they really understood how, how undeniable it is and how obvious it is that we are so vastly overpopulated. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, I mean, obviously you, you were born in a, not, uh, not entirely, but a predominantly Catholic country. Um, I know that, uh, interestingly, that isn't a given that there's going to be those attitudes because Brazil's fertility rate's been going down. And I think there's been an awful lot of good work like uh, Bill Ryerson's with soap operas, whereby you know, the, the models of smaller families has been something that the population at large has got. And of course, Italy, you know, the home of the Vatican, well, they're not really listening that closely to the Pope given their fertility rate. So there's, there is hope. There is hope despite the Pope. I mustn't say that because I'll be in trouble because my wife's a Catholic, but not necessarily that ardent um but there's so there is potentially those sort of religious pressures as well one of the things i'm really conscious of as a as a man and a population campaigner is i spend a lot of time thinking i'm saying all the right things by talking about women's choice and responsibilities and opportunities and empowerment i think hang on a minute what about the blokes as paul brilliantly came in we have responsibilities we have choices to make and i think there's quite a a good lesson for us, particularly hearing this panel tonight, that actually we need to, and, and it's one of the programs we're working with a great organization in Africa called Dandelion Africa, run by a, um, a, a wonderful Kenyan woman called Wendo Azed. And she's got a program called Boys for Change, where it's actually it's the young men who are going out to say, we don't want our sisters to be forced to get married to older relatives or men, you know, 20, 30 years older than them. We don't want them to have FGM, female genital mutilation. We want them to have the same opportunities and choices we have. And I think that's a really, you know, that's a really great opportunity and something that we can do more pushing. And I'm, I'm conscious that population matters, that we must talk more about men's choices and responsibilities in a sort of slightly sort of counter way of the patriarchal society. It's like, 
look at yourselves, guys. I'm sorry, I made that comment. Anybody <laughs> want to agree, <laughs> disagree? Oh no, I'm sorry. I, I, I will just shut up again. Um, well, um, Robin. Yeah. Speaking about um, uh, men's choices and and sort of the how men are often kind of get let, let off the hook. I think uh, I think that it's important. Something following something Sophia said about you know she has friends with the, all the means and choosing to have five five children. I think it's important to remember um, you know for men and women a large family is the default position um, in, a, in a heterosexual couple. And so in the US and, and probably similar for a lot of European countries where women want one or two children on average, um, women will spend about five years trying to get pregnant, pregnant, so not fertile or, or exclusive breastfeeding. So again, not fertile, but the average American woman spends about 30 years trying to separate having sex and a nice and a good sex life from getting pregnant. And that's a long time to do things consistently, correctly. Um, and so, so, you know, oftentimes it happens that, that people get pregnant, um, you know, unintendedly, and especially in the US, unintended pregnancy rates are super high. Um, I, the Gut Guttmacher Institute says there are about 2.8 million births every year in the US that are um, from an unintended pregnancy. So there's a lot of opportunity there, both for women and men to make sure that we can make it as easy as possible for people to get the family size they want. Thank you. And I'm just like, I'm gonna to come to Paul first, but I've got a general question for, for, for all of you. Um, we're right in the midst of the pandemic and it, the, the positive aspects of it, such as they are, appear to be people's greater awareness of and sort of wish for connection with nature and there's a lot of chat particularly in the UK media about that it's almost on you know on the radio or on the tv every day which is a great thing because suddenly people are aware that nature may be coming a bit closer or places they'd never heard or seen it before it's coming back in but I wonder if that's a lasting chain change or whether it's sort of gone with the wind and gone with vaccination I want to come to you Paul first, because you were talking about this before we started the session. Well, I think it's likely to be temporary, but it could become permanent. I, the, if there's any hope, in my view, it's in the greater Thunbergs and so on. Uh, the kids are beginning to realize that we're screwing up their future. Uh, and uh, again, I think the communications issue is huge. Uh, one, of, I'm very proud, I'll quote, one of our students, uh, Kim Nicholas uh, was a co-author on a brilliant paper which calculated that in any rich country, uh, somebody who gave up having one child, not I mean having one fewer child, was the equivalent of 23 people giving up driving automobiles in terms of greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. Uh, so there's lots of things that people can know uh, but I'm desperately unhappy with the failure of our society, the United States in particular, to come in any way sensibly to grasp uh, with the pandemic. And for, if you want to see how bad our education system is, and of course, some people like Alicia work with very, very fine people. There's some excellent people in our education system. But the average American clearly doesn't know what the hell exponential growth means. In other words, everybody uh, has to have an explanation of why, if you just have two or three people uh, in your community with a disease like uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, why that doesn't imply you're always going to just have a few people that have it. It's amazing that something that should be taught in middle school at least to start and maybe in grade school uh, is not the average politician has no clue say nothing of the average uh, uh, businessman. Very good. Leilani, do you want to follow on with that? Because I know you've got quite a tight schedule, but um, what are your thoughts? You know, can, can you see some of those goods coming out of COVID? Are they going to last? Or you know, do, you, do you share Paul's reasonably pessimistic view? I mean, I, I obviously don't know which way it's going to go. I'm hopeful that a lot of these changes will be permanent. I mean, I think 
you know, this is a great example. We're all in different parts of the world and we're, we're getting to sit down together and have a conversation and share it with the world and realizing that we don't have to all get on planes and fly to one space to do panel discussions. I, I think about how many screenings I worked on a film called Racing Extinction. And um, we also, we we're addressing the sixth mass extinction of species in it. And we've made it available for um, teachers to use this for their, their classes online um, worldwide kindergarten through 12th grade. And we've already had 50,000 teachers download the movie and show it to their students. And we have lesson plans that go with it. So it's very turnkey for the teacher. And so since I've been stuck at home, yeah, I've really been home mostly since March, mid-March. Um, I've done a lot of these Q and A's, you know, just like we're doing with Sophia's film, but with Racing Extinction and talking to students and teachers. And I think back at how many of these Q and A's I did before, and I would be getting on a plane and flying to Vancouver and then going to hotel. And it, and it took so much time to just have this, you know, little one hour Q and A after a, a screening. Um, so I'm hoping that like a lot of the world is realizing how many of these plane flights that we're taking and how much of our, our traveling is unnecessary. And I know there's quite a few um, big companies. I think Twitter was one that said, you know, all of our employees, even, even after the pandemic is over, we're letting everyone work from home from now on. So I'm hoping that that, you know, our, our feeling that we have to get on a plane always to have a face to face with someone will go away since we've got these great um, video conferencing. And um, I know that I have learned that I sort of kind of like slowing down a little yeah. bit. And I was such a, you know, jet setter and busy, busy doing this and that. And being stuck at home has been a really nice change of pace for me. It was hard at first, but now I, I kind of like it. I'm sort of dreading everything returning back to normal if it does return to the way that it was before. I, I hope it doesn't return. Yeah, I think that's the thing. What What, what is, you know, we should not be returning to normal. I've got Alicia's hand raised. I was going to say, Leilani, if you need to leave us because of your next appointment don't you know that that you know, pl please do but it's been fantastic having you on the panel but uh we've got I'm a bit of time i think 30. cool alicia that was from prior oh sorry apologies do you want to follow no, on anyway in terms of do you think do you think there's some good coming out of covid hard to say with hundreds and thousands of people certainly in the uk or 100, over 100,000 people in the uk dead ahead of their time the figures in the states are pretty scary mexico we don't even know from other countries um wh what what's the silver lining to the dark that, cloud yeah that reconnection with nature i think is a good one I, and i haven't thought much about it we've been up in lake tahoe since last march my family and i and uh I mean, I already felt well connected with nature, but um, we certainly see like a mass exodus from the cities to the rural parts of, uh, of California, at least. And I think it's happening around this country. Um, I don't know, I, I'm kind of skeptical that people remem will remember um, for a long, like we'll keep in mind what we have learned, which is about, I think all of us have felt uh, a reconnection with nature, a reconnection with our families and friends and loved ones to the extent we can be together with them. Um, and I, I hope we can carry that on for uh, a few years, if not a few decades. Um, but I have a lot of faith in our um, ability to carry, carry lessons with us. Um, and I think on the downside, COVID has affected a lot of women's access to family planning and safe abortion. And that there's going to be a, a, there is a baby boom on its way. Yes, I've, I've, I've certainly seen, seen that. Um... We, we've been working with um, a, a small community in in um, Kibera or, or Kibra, as it's now called, which is the largest slum in Nairobi and indeed the largest slum in Africa. And we met some fantastic people when we were over for the International Conference on Population and Development. And we got a sort of, you know, a, a plea from one of the community activists we met saying, people can't get to the pharmacies, you know, for their family planning. You know, there is, there is a real shortage of contraception. And we were able to work with another organization in Africa and, you know, get some condoms distributed as alongside hygiene, because if you think hygiene is a pain in the 
but in 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 developed countries it's impossible in some parts of the world etc so again a really good you know reminder of of, of the balance um, I've just had I've got quite a few questions coming in around the sort of tension between economic growth and population growth and it sort of relates I mean Sophia sorry I haven't asked you about your your positives but um, can I just do the economics one and I'll come back to you on sure. that yeah and, and the um, what we see is uh, mainstream old school GDP economists saying we need growth growth is good you know the economy will only grow if there's more consumers and there's been a lot of what we would certainly call sort of alarmist headlines where people talk about uh, fertility rates crashing, jaw dropping crash in, in global fertility and numbers of births. And this means that economies from the US to Japan to Italy to the UK are going to go into free fall. Um, I just wondered if, if um, you could comment on that and how do we counter the fact that it's the bottom line which steam, still seems to drive most politicians and I'm afraid the media immediately go to it as well and they push aside environmental uh, and, and sustainability arguments. Um, yeah. Sophia, why don't you answer that because it's very strong in your film. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I'm, I know that you're very familiar with um, a concept that's called a demographic dividend. And, you know, with how when people um, have smaller families in general, they tend to um, they tend to get more education and they tend to become in general, just like Alicia um, touched on, they tend to uh, increase in general the, their level of wealth. And so this kind of idea that we have that we've set our economy as you know growth 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 is this something that we need to come to terms with because as dr potts mentioned in the film if you combine the way that our economy is growing with the way that our population is growing we're making twice the impact every 17 years and as he so eloquently said we can't go on like how many doublings can we do before we completely destroy the planet? And, you know, when we're so obsessed on, I, I think what you mentioned about COVID also touches on that because, okay, we think that we need to keep growing our economy, but then when it comes back to bite us in just some small way, like a small virus, look at how it crashes and burns everything from economies to livelihoods. And um, so I think there just needs to be a lot of greater awareness about, about that, that, that it's actually a living, breathing planet that we can't just roll over for a financial system that uh, we just wanna ram through, if that makes any sense at all. And, and by the way, I, I think that with the COVID situation, we're not having enough awareness of, um, of how it's closely related to to our impact on nature like i see people thinking well you know now that covid is here everything is uh, gonna be a-okay when even and I, the last thing that you know I, I was thinking about when you were talking about the covid um so many people have lost their livelihoods and have moved from big cities to forests to to rural areas and are now living off of the forest and that has actually resulted in an increased amount of deforestation. So it's, it's, we have such a large impact right now that every little shift that we do just kind of ends up having uh, detrimental and difficult, unexpected consequences. If that makes any sense. I think I rambled a little it bit does. here. No, Sorry about that. And, and I think it sort of relates to the, the other question around economics and those questions are still coming in. And I just wanted to ask about, you know, you, people are making individual lifestyle changes and choices and, we, and, and choices at the heart of our, of our campaigns in terms of enabling choice. But we need big business and we need politicians to you know, leverage. The, they're the ones with their allegedly with their hands on, on the levers of power. And 
it is, you know, your film is very clear that actually it's system change we need, you know, absolutely root and branch systemic change. How, how, do, we, how do we achieve that? And I think Paul may be coming on that as well, but um, Sophia, do you want to just go first? Then we'll yeah, yeah. just the last thing. I think that system changes depending also on what people want. You know, and so I think, you know, the government, if you think it's not some isolated body of aliens, you know, and they respond to what people are concerned about and what people respond to and what people care about. So even if it's, you know, system changes in the big companies, in the big governments, you know, they respond to what people are aware of and what people, you know, really are preoccupied of. So I think that that's kind of the basis for the system changes. You know, also just creating awareness so that people and the governments who are formed by us or are formed by people respond to that more vigorously and more appropriately. Very good. Paul. Uh, I have to say that the economists, the macroeconomists are probably the most dangerous group of people on the planet. If I had my way, I would close every business school in the world, because although there's a big literature on how bad they are on distributional issues, that is their main goal is to take money away from people with less money and keep it themselves. If they do things right, they lead to growth. We need a shift that's equivalent in scale to either the agricultural or the industrial revolution or we're not going to make it. The idea, I'm a great fan of Joe Biden. I met him once. He was a great guy. We had a great conversation. <clears throat> but he still makes climate change one of five things, whereas the existential threats we're facing now have to be dealt with essentially immediately. If you know anything about the deep history of climate on this planet, just to mention one, uh, the uh, we have been extremely fortunate. We mainly got the agricultural revolution, if you consider that a good thing. And of course, it's what led to prejudice, to war, to um, um, racism, to slavery. All of that traces back to the agricultural revolution. We had almost 300,000 years, maybe that many, without those little features uh, in a very nice world in many ways. But now, thanks to the ag revolution and the industrial revolution, we are sawing off the limb we're sitting on. Uh, and it's not just climate disruption. Uh, it's also toxification of the entire planet, getting rid of our soils, getting rid of our fresh water, on and on and on. The biodiversity crisis, again, uh, which we're embedded in the system. So basically, to talk about what steps we're going to take, like moving to electric cars, the problem is we have too many people with already too many cars, the cars also need paved over areas. Guess what gets paved over? Uh, so uh, in my view, uh, all, almost all of this doesn't face the real super problems. Uh, it may be that uh, Alicia knows that uh, not uh, Diamond Smith by any chance or Kirk Smith from Berkeley. Uh, Kirk and his colleagues have done calculations which show most many cities will no longer in the near future be able to host winter or summer Olympics because of the changes in climate. The heat in the Sahel uh, is marginally on the area where people won't be able to work outside. And guess what? Most farmers in the Sahel don't have air conditioned cabs on harvesters. Uh, and that's going to the all the talk about climate change that focuses on sea level rise doesn't focus on what's really critical, and that is the agricultural system. Uh, I didn't mean to rave on, I'm sorry, but uh, we, I think all of us agree that if you don't do something about these major problems very soon, uh, they're gonna solve themselves. I mean, the, the idea that, oh, well, we could continue, continue, just consider to continue to grow to keep the GNP growing. Guess what? Uh, the environment, the biosphere, has other things to say about that. No one would accuse you of raving on, Paul, but I think it, the difficulty for anybody who's looked at the, at the science, as you have, and has, has done the maths, 
the, the, the prospects are extremely challenging to say the least. And it's hard not to, you know, as Sophia, you're trying to do with this film is wake people up. It's, it's an alarm call, isn't it? It's like, you know, when those activists in, in Poland you know, wanted to say goodbye to the re regime, they said, everybody get an alarm clock and set it to, to noon and put it outside the parliament that they're going you know, out. And it's so, how do we wake people up? Because I think particularly in, in the West, we are still so cushioned. We don't, we don't feel the impact. You know, I've, I've been privileged to meet colleagues in, in Kenya and I've seen where the crops are failing and the seasonal rains are failing and the people there, the communities there, you know, they are not like the imbecilic politicians in nice suits in, in air conditioned offices in the developed world. They say, we see climate change, we know what's happening. We want to manage our family size, we want help, you know, they, they get it. So, so how we get that out there is really important. And that relates to one of the comments that was, came in uh, on, on chat and uh, a very reasonable comment, actually, if I can find it. Uh, not a question, a comment. While our panels are comprised of individuals who look like the current panel, from what I see, and diversity is lacking, we cannot expect to truly impact the population question. My continent, Africa, is growing in leaps and bounds. So having people who look like me and my fellow continent, my, my fellow continental compadres is the way to go. And that's from Farouk Mangera. And I completely agree, Farouk. And just to say, uh, I'm very pleased with our panel and, and everything that's been said. And, and we've got a good diversity in terms of gender. For our World Population uh, Day panel discussion, we had a good representation of colleagues and partners from the Global South. So we do try to do that. And, and uh, I completely take your point. And we have to be working with colleagues across the world in the most hard pressed uh, communities. And I think that's very much where your work is, Alicia. Sophia, that's who you're reaching out to. That, that's certainly our instinct. But Alicia, you might just want to add your views on that. Yeah, it's um, it's true. I uh, I was thinking about the same thing. I uh, I was just um, on Tuesday at um, Population Connection panel um, where they did they showed the film Eight Billion Angels, which I will recommend. Um, that was produced by Terry Spar at Earth Overshoot, um, and that film had eleven. I don't, I, I often am not as aware as some other people, but I looked. The film had eleven experts, and I looked at the panel of experts and two of them were Indian and, and two of them were women and the rest were, were white males. And I was thinking we, we, need, we need to make more of an effort. We have a Sahel leadership program whereby we recruit and try to engage and support um, professionals from the Sahel already working in the fields of empowerment and education, family planning and safe abortion. Um, and we have now been running this for five years. It's based on another leadership program at Berkeley. Um, so through that, through that program, we have a network of now it's several hundred really um, passionate, articulate Sahelian people that I often recommend for panels. Um, anyhow, it's something it's it's, uh, you know, sometimes um, it takes more of an effort because it's often the the civil society in the West that's organizing these kinds of events. So the easiest is to get people who you already know and are in touch with, but uh, it's worth the effort and um, I see, uh, I think it was Farouk, I see the, the participants point. Yeah, thank you. And again, we had a World Population Day event in Nigeria, which was at, at the invitation of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. Um, and what was brilliant about that was, you know, I was the only um, white old man in the, in, 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 on the panel. Uh, but the, 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 my fellow speakers and panelists and the audience were just brilliant. And, and I would not have got to a meeting in the UK where the state minister for the environment was, pr was present, where the, uh, the female deputy director general of the National Population Commission, we don't even have one in the UK, was speaking. And he was so eloquent and outspoken around the issue of population, saw it as an absolute no brainer had no inhibitions about it and really made me feel, you know, seem a rather hesitant little Englishman. And I thought that is absolutely the way to go. And, 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 and we try to give voice in, in our work to our colleagues 
uh, there in the front line and also within our, you know, our, our communities in the UK. So uh, that's very well made point, uh, Farouk. Without, uh, at the risk of uh, doing what so many blinking programs do, um, and because the film is very hard hitting, uh, Sophia, and your work, Paul, does not pull its punches, it tells the truth, inconvenient as that, that is for some people. Can you, could you each offer us a, a sort of positive um, solution stroke, individual action, key priority you'd like to see happen, which may, which may just prevent, as you quoted uh, Sophia in your promo, humanity has backed itself into an ecological endgame as we approach mid-century. How can we just come out of that cul-de-sac a little bit? Um, Leilani, I'll start with you because I know you have to go. Um, so what, sorry, offering one solution? Something positive, if it, something positive without it being shiny eyed and naive. <laughs> um, I guess something positive that I love seeing that we're doing is Sophia getting this movie out and um, we need to let people know where they can see the full film. I saw somebody asking that in the questions. Um, you know, I love, my favorite part of the film is actually Paul's interview where you said the one unlimited resource is morons. <laughs> and I think we, we've seen a lot of that in 2020 with like COVID deniers and all the science deniers. Um, but the, the, one, the one thing that I, I did wanna say is I heard, I don't know who said this, but they were talking about how all these solutions that, and I've brought up a lot of these solutions, electric cars, solar power, veganism, you know, these personal choices that we can all make to try and reduce our carbon footprint. But that at the end of the day, those little things are so small that they compared it to like a house that is being flooded and you have, you know, all the faucets are open and you know, an electric car is like me maybe picking up one bucket of water and throwing it out of the house and my solar panels is another and my veganism is another, but that the real end solution is we have to turn off the faucet, right? And so that then comes back again to population. And I loved Paul's comments where he said, yes, consumption is a problem, but so is population. The, the area of a rectangle is determined not just by its length, but also by its width. And I use that, um, I copy that from you all the time, Paul, because I think it's so eloquent. Um, so my hope is that a lot of people see your film, Sophia, and a lot of people here share it that have, have seen the clip today. And that helps more people make the decision like my husband and I to stay child-free by choice. And um, and, and to make that more normal, to make that an accepted thing so that I, we're not weird that we didn't have kids, we're not strange, we're not being judged for that. We have to make it an acceptable social uh, idea that it's okay to not have kids and that's a fine and a totally valid choice because I think just for so long it's just expected that you're supposed to give your parents grandkids. Thank you so much. I'm going to come to Alicia and then Paul, and then appropriately for Endgame, um, Sophia, to make the final comment. So, Alicia. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, the, the length times width thing is a great one. I hadn't heard that, I like it a lot. Paul is right. A lot of people don't understand what is exponential growth. What does it look like? There's a great children's book that's also good for adults called The King's Chessboard, which teaches this, which I just read with my kids. Um, and I would say in terms of what, I mean, I can see the, urgency in the discussion, I can see people want to know, you know, what can be done. I'd say just pick something you're passionate about and, and support it. Look for ways to get involved and support it. Um, for me, it's family planning and girls education in the Sahel, but it may be different for other people. And uh, I think one easy takeaway, which is always, um, I always recommend is just talking to people about population and kind of breaking the silence around it. Letting people know that population is a factor in all aspects of sustainability. And, uh, and that it can be addressed by, by, by educating girls and women, by family planning, by access to safe abortion. And these are all things that respect women's rights. So they have to be done anyway. So let's get on board. Fantastic. Paul. Well, well, first thing I want to thank all of you for what you're doing. When I joined Stanford's faculty in the biology department, there was not a single female faculty member. Now we have, uh, 
the strength of our department is basically female is in the ecology and evolution area. And I'm delighted that actually uh, Robin and I are outnumbered today. And I would be quite happy if it was all female for some reason. Anyway, the only thing I guess I would add to all the stuff I've uh, lectured you on is uh, if a single thing uh, comes up, if somebody says growth to you, uh, just respond redistribution. That's what we need to have. That's wonderfully pithy. Um, Sophia, just to come back in terms of, you know, how's it been for you? You're the filmmaker. You you catalyze this event. And um, I think I'm allowed a little bit of time just to sum up very briefly in terms of links and things. But but Sophia, why don't you have the fan, final word as, as our panelist? Well, film. something really positive, Robin, is the fact that even though we're in such a, you know, dire situation, it really couldn't be more dire what, what we're facing with the environment, with what you're doing. But the really good thing or one really, really good thing is that there are things that we can do that would make an immense impact. And we don't need to have the technology to go to Mars to do that. We don't need to have the most amazing technology in the world. Something as simple as having fewer children. Something as simple as you know deciding perhaps to have fewer children or potentially going child-free or adopting instead. It would be so impactful, as well as other things that you know don't need technology, like changing our diet. Like in the in the credits of the film, I reference an article from the Oxford University that talks about how a collective diet shift away from, for example, animal foods would relieve you know a huge amount of pressure, which could give us you know more time. Obviously, it's never just the solution because we're just growing so relentlessly. But I feel like these two options would be so very impactful and there's no need for any big laws or for government to get on board or for companies to adopt it. It's just so empowering that we could have such a big impact with doing something that's so completely within our reach. And so I think that that's a positive thing to all of this very serious mess that we're in. Thank you very, very much indeed. We have sort of reached the end, I think. And so I wanted to say thank you to all our panelists and just fantastic contributions and great to have got you together. Um, thank you to all the participants who are out there. And I hope some of your questions were answered. Um, Olivia, you might wish to come in in the sense that Population Matters, you know, we have we've recorded this. We will be putting up this up on our website and we'll put up all the links to all the organisations of our panelists and and links that they've mentioned so that becomes a resource and um, in some ways we will continue this conversation and so do do find us on our website www.populationmatters.org but we'll also make sure you find Paul and Leilani and Sophia and Alicia and all the fantastic work they are doing as well so just to say thank you very much indeed. Olivia did you want to just add anything? Uh, yes, I just wanted to add that, um, well, first of all, thank you all so much for joining. And if you did have a burning question that didn't get answered, uh, feel free to email it to us and we will try to get that answered for you. So I think Thanks that to all of you. To end. And yeah, thank, thank you to all of you. And uh, I'm going to hit the leave button. Um, but yeah, thank many, you so many much. thanks. You. Thank, Take you, care. Thank, you. thank you guys. Thank you guys. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Bye all. Bye all. Bye bye. bye. bye.